right, welcome to SO uh, 36 here in Berlin, where I'm with Chris from Antiflag. I am ecstatic to be here. This is one of my favorite clubs to play in the world. Um, uh, they always try to get us to move to a different club, and we don't ever want to. We'll play at SO forever. It's it's um, uh, it's a it's a bastion of the punk community, and uh, we're honored every time we get to be here. Yeah, yeah, not by far your first time in here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So uh, yesterday there was a charity hockey match. Yeah, yeah. I'm very tired. You want to tell me about that? Yeah, it was very cool. So um, um, a couple years ago, I met some folks from an organization uh, called Hockey is Diversity. And um, they were just were looking for ways to um, expand their reach and, and talk to some people who don't know about the game of ice hockey and don't really... Um, uh, don't really interact with it all that much. And um, I think that, that there is a, there are a lot of hurdles within that sport in particular, um, economic hurdles, uh, racial hurdles for a lot of people, um, physical hurdles for a lot of people. So they're, they're trying to um, expand the reach of the game and introduce many different people to the game. And um, I played hockey up until I was, 16 and joined anti-flag and then got back into um playing the game around 10 years ago or so and um so it just seemed right up my alley kind of combining activism and this thing that i love really much and and so uh uh you know we were just kind of talking about what we can do and we did a really fun game with um you know some paraplegic olympians and um, some other uh, 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 women's German Olympians and some other uh, old players from uh, uh, from Germany, and that was that was last year, and uh, it, it just kind of got our brains firing as to like what could we do, how could we get make this bigger, and so um, we put together this event yesterday. Um, I had very little to do with it other than just saying like yes to everything they asked, um, but it was awesome. I mean. We parked the bus at the ice arena. I woke up there, you know, they sharpened my skates. I had a great game with um, ex-players from the Berlin Ice Baron and uh, many players from all over uh, Europe and Germany. And, um, uh, you know, over 200 people came. They raised over 2,500 euros for Sea Watch and for Hockey's Diversity. And uh, it was very successful for everyone involved. And Again, we're just grateful that we get to do this. And a cool thing, we played an acoustic show afterwards and asked people how if it was their first ever hockey game and about 50% of the people raised their hand. And that's really what we want to do is we want to introduce people to this thing that we think can be an extension of our empathy and an extension of our activism, um, but also is a lot of fun. And, and we should be searching for things that are fun for us in such difficult times that we find ourselves in. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, what's your team then? Is it Penguins? Yeah, it's the Pittsburgh <laughs> Penguins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Pittsburgh Penguins have been my team since um, since I was three years old. So, uh, yeah, I'm not changing. <laughs> the Ice Baron folks are very nice, but I'm not changing. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, as you mentioned already, activism is a big part for mm -hmm. you, and a big part of, has always been a big part of Anti Flag too. So, uh, for you, like you said. Uh, difficult times right yeah. now so what are the most pressing well, that's an interesting question i mean i think that the the to narrow it down the most pressing thing is extending empathy into our lives um there's a lot of discussion in the world about privilege and about um uh, what what it means to have privilege but i think that 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 it begins with our ability to see other people's pain um, so when folks like Boris Johnson or Donald Trump or the AFD come in power and set their sights on the gay and the lesbian and transgender communities of the world, set their sights on women, set their sights on people of color, immigrants and refugees, and further scapegoat and marginalize those that are most victimized within our societies, we need to see them. We need to um, do the work within our privilege to support those people that are in pain. Um, the same goes for folks in the Middle East. Right now, our global economies are propped up on, on war 
and environmental devastation. And both of those things are creating that immigrant and refugee crisis. So if the AFD or if Donald Trump or Boris Johnson are truly concerned with stopping um, immigrants and refugees from coming to their countries, I would say that they should stop selling and making bombs and tanks and guns that create refugee crises in the first place. I would say that they should stop having economies that are based on environmental devastation that are creating ec uh, 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 emergency scenarios for those that are fleeing um, uh, the planet destruction that's forcing them out of their homes. So, uh, you know, again, I think it's just about taking time out of your life to see others. And there are massive amounts of money, massive amounts of force being put into pushing each and every one of us to have blinders on, to only care about what's in front of us, um, and to to not have empathy for others. It's, 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 not, it's by design, it's not by accident. So I think that, that uh, there are a lot of forces working against us, but we need to continue to try to inject empathy into everything we do. And, um, you know, that's even as simple as a fucking hockey game. You know, you can care about other people when you're doing other things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, getting a bit closer to music. Yeah. Uh, one problem uh, with bands here in Berlin right now is gentrification and oh, clubs yeah, are closing yeah. and squats are yeah. in trouble. Uh, what are your thoughts on gentrification? Yeah, it's so hard. I mean, especially, you know, where we're from in Pittsburgh, it's just a massive part of what's happening there. And um, I don't I don't I don't really have an answer um, for it. I, I, I you know, it's it's a thing that um, especially in Berlin, it's a thing I'm not particularly educated upon. So I can't say uh, what's happening here. I can only speak to what's happening in our community. Um, but I do know that in Pittsburgh, we have this industry of healthcare and we have this university industry that's, that's created this massive boom in Pittsburgh. It's brought um, Apple and Google and Uber offices to Pittsburgh, which has people coming from Silicon Valley in California, buying housing in Pittsburgh without even seeing it. They're seeing, oh man, a house only costs $200,000. That's nothing, and they, they buy it, and not realizing that it's driving up property values and displacing other people, um, and the gentrification that you speak of is, is happening there. And so I think that, that you would begin with having those industries that are there, that are creating this gentrification. We should have a system that taxes them fairly so that those taxes then go into building infrastructures for poor people. Um, in America, gentrification is exacerbated by the fact that we have industries of healthcare and prison industrial complexes that make money off of people getting sick, that make money off of people uh, being put into jail and in prison. So uh, I think that, that when you have all these forces happening together, poor people in these areas that are getting pushed out, um, you know, their backs are truthfully against the wall. And um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it leads to what you're talking about. It leads to a lack of the arts. Um, it leads to, to a lack of places for music and places for people to um, uh, find community and find commonality with one another because public spaces get limited, become private spaces. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I assume that many of those problems are similar, but um, you know, I, I think that, that one easy fix for it is to have the people that are creating the problem pay their fair share in, in solving it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's go to music then. Yeah, great. <laughs> so, uh, Vision 2020 is uh, out actually well, yeah, just yeah. now. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, now that the album is out, what are your own thoughts on the album itself and the, well, making of it, the process? Yeah, you know, to be honest, like, I absolutely love it. And I'm, I am, I've been um, almost push to a lack of words to describe how humbled I am by the response to it, by the amount of people who've already listened to it, who are sharing it and talking about it. 
Um, now, because of the internet being as powerful as it is, I get to see instantly who hears it and who's talking about it and see it in real time. And um, it's, it's incredible to me. It, it's, uh, uh, it's a record that, that I felt like we needed to make. Um, some of the other guys in the band weren't particularly ready to make a record. Um, Justin had lost his mom to cancer. Uh, Pat had just had a baby. Uh, Chris had our guitar player. His wife was pregnant. And I was just locked in the studio writing songs all day while those guys just kind of figured their life out, you know. And um, one day, you know, we all had a meeting and I said, here, I have 30 songs. I want to call the record 2020 Vision. I want to release it in January. We need to go into the studio in August to make that happen. And everybody was like, okay, you know, we, we trust you. Let's go. And um, we wrote a, a handful of other songs together uh, that kind of shaped the sound of the record and shaped the, the, the overall uh, themes of the album. But, um, uh, but it, was, it was really nice to um, have it happen so quickly and, you know, that really doesn't happen for us. Usually we pick the title of the album at the end. Usually we're writing songs in the studio last minute or, you know, changing or, or reshaping things. This time we were very focused and had an agenda and we knew what we wanted to do. And, you know, making a record about the false populism movements of the AFD and of Boris Johnson and of Donald Trump, I hope that it is irrelevant in seven months. I hope this all changes and we can just go make another one. Um, but uh, uh, I really wanted to use this transition into a new de new decade, use the idea of 2020, which feels very powerful to me um, and feels like a moment when we actually have the ability to shape and write what our future looks like. Um, I wanted to take that idea and, and, and document it. And so that's what the album is about. It's about you as an individual r recognizing that another world is possible and we need to do the work to create it. Okay, and uh, what are your feelings on uh, playing this imp these important songs for audiences? For example, yeah. uh, Sold Out Geek tonight yeah, at yeah. SO36. Yeah, we... Um, we are playing five songs from the album um, at every show, and um, that's crazy. I mean, that's half the record. <laughs> so uh, our set lists are 22 songs, 23 songs a night, um, and uh, they span all of the records, but there's a focus on, on 2020 Vision and, and this album. And, and um, again, you know, they're Unbreakable, The Disease, um, Hate Conquers All, the song 2020 Vision, they're going over better than some of our oldest songs that we've been playing for 20 years. So it's um, it's been tremendously humbling to uh, see people connect with it this much, and uh, we're just um, we're just honored that anybody comes at all. So uh, 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 I know a lot of bands say that like. They wouldn't do this if it wasn't for the audience or the fans or whatever, um, but we would. <laughs> this is the only thing we know how to do. Um, I'm sorry. I, I, we'd play to nobody if we had to, um, but uh, we're really grateful that people do come, and, and, and especially in Germany here, uh, so many people come out and so many people are, are kind and, and believe in in this type of work and this, this activism and and, and incorporating empathy into all the things that you do. So, um, yeah, we, we can't we can't uh, we can't wait for the show and can't wait to get it going. Okay, is your whole tour so hectic? Because last night you had a acoustic yeah. gig after yeah. the match. And we and have one today. today. <laughs> yeah, before the gig in a punk rock uh, um, record store. <laughs> well, it's kind of the pain of releasing an album on tour um, is that you have to do a lot more work. But uh, again. Um, we uh, we're very fortunate, you know. We we people come to see us play music. Um, if this is the hardest thing we do, then fuck it, man. This is great. <laughs> so so I'll, I'll be I'll take being tired. I'll take um, being a little beat up from the uh, ex Ice Baron players uh, if that's what it takes. Uh, so it's um, 
yeah, it's, it's not working in a coal mine. It's, um, it's sharing art and sharing stories of activism and sharing stories of personal relationships with punk rock. And, um, we, uh, we get a lot of hope and a lot of optimism from this work. So we're grateful just to get the opportunity to do it. Okay. Thank you so much. And thank all the you. best for 2020. Yeah. Thanks brother. Thank you.